Good afternoon or evening if you're joining us from India and uh, welcome to the LSESU India Forum, the business and finance panel that we're hosting today. Uh, my name is Pranidatta and I will serve as your co-moderator for this evening. Uh, just before we begin, I just wanted to point out that uh, there may be some um, you know, unforeseen Wi-Fi issues. That's one of the disadvantages of hosting a Zoom webinar, but um, we have um, we have, we have team members standing by who will take over in case anything goes wrong. So we should be able to sort everything out pretty quickly, uh, but just a PSA before I start. And um, so today we have a very insightful and uh, engaging discussion, which we hope to conduct with our business development and uh, with our business development panel. And we want to address themes of business development and post pandemic recovery uh, for firms in India. This is in line with the main theme of our conference today, which is embracing the change. The change, of course, being uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And before we begin, I just want to take a minute to thank everyone on the LIF team, which has organized this massive event for us this week. Uh, the LSE India Forum has an enduring legacy for serving as the largest student-led India-centric conference in the UK. And this year, we're proud to provide both international and domestic students an avenue to engage with truly inspirational Indian personalities from various industries and sectors. Uh, speaking of inspirational Indian personalities, I would like to uh, introduce our seriously impressive panel for today. So first up, we have Mr. Amanpreet Singh Bajaj, who is uh, responsible for the growth of Airbnb in India since 2015, and also manages operations as general manager for Southeast Asia, Hong Kong, and Taiwan. He has featured as part of our coveted, uh, of, he's, he's featured as uh, part of the coveted 40 under 40 list for 2017 and 2018 by Fortune Magazine in India, and also co-founded and headed operations at letsbuy.com, uh, which was one of the largest online retailers of branded IT communication and consumer electronic products in India and was later acquired by Flipkart. Uh, next up, we're really excited to have Dr. Sodhi. Uh, Dr. Sodhi is the Managing Director at Amul India and his expertise lies in uh, market research, account management, food processing, FMCG and business development. Uh, Dr. Sodhi has headed the marketing and sales function of Amul for more than two decades and has spearheaded the highly innovative marketing campaigns like uh, Amul Dut Pita India, which by the way is very hard to say without singing. So yeah. Uh, next up, we have uh, Mr. Nikhil Aroda. Uh, Mr. Aurora leads the strategy, business growth, and operations and customer care for GoDaddy in, in India as its uh, VP and managing director. In his role at the world's leading platform dedicated to small businesses, Mr. Aurora is passionate about helping small businesses and entrepreneurs establish and grow their ventures. Prior to joining GoDaddy India, uh, he was a member of the WeWork Global team, where he worked as the operational head of the firm. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Akash Nahar. Mr. Akash Nahar, an LSE alum, is the director and co-founder of India's Impact Collective, which focuses on providing investments to companies, organizations, and funds with the intention to generate a measurable and beneficial social or environmental impact alongside financial return. He is also the director and co-founder of YWC Ventures, a venture capital and private equity firm operating in Asia, and has delivered various talks at global public policy forums, most recently at the House of Commons in the UK. And we were supposed to have Mr. Sandeep Chug with us, but unfortunately he won't be joining us today because of uh, personal reasons. Uh, but we, I, I would like to introduce our moderator next, uh, Dr. Saipriya Kamath, who is an ISB graduate. And Dr. Kamath is an assistant professor of accounting here at the LSC and provides consulting services to massive institutions such as the European Parliament, the Reserve Bank of India, and the Indian Finance Ministry. Uh, before I turn over the floor to Dr. Kamath, I would just like to point out some quick housekeeping notes in case we missed them before. Uh, so we aim to have Dr. Kamath moderate the discussion for about an hour or so, and then we will open up the floor to audience questions for, say, 20 to 30 minutes. And the audience can send in questions to the chat box, which uh, I will constantly monitor along with my team and pick out the most relevant questions that we have for uh, the topic at hand today. If you have a question targeted towards a specific panelist, please do mention their name so it's easier to identify who you're asking the question to. And uh, without further ado, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Kamath. 
Um, thanks, Pranit, for that. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you know five business leaders here with, with, with us today. Um, I wanted to talk to you about a variety of issues. So um, to start off with, you know, COVID has affected all of us, some more than others. But uh, in the midst of all this, it's very heartening to read articles like a recent one in FT, which said India is testing out anytime, anywhere delivery uh, because of the new opportunities created by COVID. So uh, through the session, I do hope to learn uh, more about how your companies are innovating. Uh, but uh, before we get on to that, let's talk a little bit about the challenges. Um, so, Mr. Amanpreet, um, let's start with Airbnb. Um, like we were discussing before, I personally do miss uh, visiting new places and, you know, going to Airbnb. Be. Uh, but, you know, because travel has been so restricted, I'm sure you would have had your own set of challenges. So could you let us know what the challenges were specific to your business and uh, your industry? Thank you, Ms. Kamath, and uh, thanks for having me on this esteemed panel. Um, it's definitely a pleasure to be here today. Virtually, I would have loved to be at the beautiful campus in London, but uh, I think for the last, what, 12 to 15 months, this is the best that we can do. Um, so I would love uh, to connect through this medium. But um, I think you're right, um, the COVID crisis has been an unprecedented one. Um, and I'm sure this word has been used so many times that it's become a cliche now uh, over the year. But uh, it, was a, it was a kind of a fork in the road moment uh, for all of us. And, um, but if you look at travel, it was one of the industries that was impacted the most, uh, given that uh, at one point of time, almost 90% of the world was under lockdown and people were confined to their homes. The planes were not flying and travel was very restricted. But I'll just zoom out a little bit and talk about travel as a need. You know, we all, as humans, we understand that travel is an innate need and pursuit of new experiences or pursuit of human connection is something which is perennial and we cannot do without that. In fact, over the years, this is something that has only gotten more stronger as we have kind of stayed indoors and kind of missed out on that. And uh, I would also say that it's very hard to predict the future, but what we know is that travel is very resilient and it's definitely is gonna come back. Uh, and it will recover. And we have seen that travel as an industry has faced multiple shocks in the past as well, you know, uh, but has always come back in a V-shaped recovery. Um, so we're looking forward to that. But we also know that obviously travel is not going to be the same as the way we were used to experiencing. And there are a number of things that have changed. And based on some of the feedback that we get in terms of listening to our host community, our guest community, and people in general, there are a few factors that are now coming up um, that kind of give us a glimpse of what travel could look like, if not in the future, but at least in the immediate future. And um, I think to start off, I think we all would have experienced that travel has become more local now. In the absence of you know cross-border travel or planes flying, a lot of people have now started to embrace the adventure of you know just getting into the car, you know putting in the fuel enough to go 200 miles and exploring a new city or a new town or a new village very close to their hometown and i think this is a trend that we continue to see is going to increase um, so i think it's a it's a kind of a boost to domestic tourism where travel is getting a little bit more hyper local and it is now happening in communities which were underserved in the past so that's that's a positive that has happened um, we also understand that you know when travel kind of return back um, one thing is for sure, people have had time to kind of introspect during the lockdown and kind of, you know, kind of revisit their choices in life. And so what we believe is that there is now a more consciousness around choosing responsible travel or sustainable travel, as we call. And this is primarily led by millennials and Gen Z's, as we call them. Um, and what it is kind of leading to is that... Um, we believe that travel is going to be very community led and it's going to be very sustainably focused, you know. So people are going to make greener choices in terms of the modes of transportation and the places that they stay and, and the kind of activities that they do, which is again good for the industry. So overall, I do believe that, you know, right now when we talk to people, what's on their mind? Uh, one thing is very clear. They want to travel again. But now, where is not the question? Where the adventures would be in the future is not something that is what they're thinking. But I think more importantly, it's going to be with whom those adventures are going to be. You know, as people have spent more time, they have kind of missed the human connection with their immediate family, with their friends. And we have done surveys across the world, including in India and other places, um, you know. And one thing is very clear. People are looking for meaningful connections as and when it's safer to travel. 
and as people kind of make responsible choices greener choices and safety and well-being is definitely on top of the criteria they want to start traveling again as and when it's safer to do so so you know we are optimistic about travel for sure in the in the short term um, no thank you for sharing that and you know you you made a very interesting point about travel being local and um uh, people being interested in uh, Um, making sustainable choices. So um, I think we will circle back in just a bit to talk more about these issues. Um, I, I wanted to talk to Dr. Sodhi um, about you know the challenges that uh, you face at Amul. I know at a point in time when our world got very restricted to what's going to be our next meal, and so you know what I mean. I I know a lot of my friends uh, who are saying. Saying, okay, what are you planning to cook? You know, and so I am assuming that led to an increase in uh, sales from households. But I'm sure you would have had your own set of challenges. So it would be good to know about the challenges that you faced, and um, like Mr. Aman Preet mentioned, some of the opportunities as well that came up during the COVID period. Well, uh, Dr. Kamath, you already started it. I mean, we are very fortunate. <clears throat> that uh, we are in business of food and uh, food growing food selling food buying and food con- food consumption never stops irrespective of whether wars flood riots covid anything it will because if it stops naturally the whole human uh, cycle will stop so we were lucky but you are right there were challenges and in the food i think uh, i mean i think covid was the best time no doubt to see the challenges but out of the challenges coming the solutions and the leadership i mean challenges for a food company like us was the biggest how to ensure that the 24 by 7 the supply chain works yeah. because our supply chain starts with 3.6 million farmers 18500 village cooperative societies so you collect the milk 10000 milk tankers 84 dairy plants 70 distribution hubs and 1 million retailer and 1.35 billion consumers see and then it is not only buying aggregating processing and distribution one has to see food is also a source of livelihood in india for 150 million families so our challenge was to hang, how to ensure one side livelihood in case of uh, the animal is when your milk 100 million families and other side to provide the tasty nutritious food available people at the door step all across india and i think uh, the supply chain was there then how to see that that our leadership and with the speed with your structure okay they come up i mean i mean everybody could have worked at home but in case of people who are involved in food you can't sit at home only people who are in invoicing or the sport system but everybody else was in the field so how to ensure they are motivated to come out because risk was there in the initial 2 3 months everybody was talking all sorts of things so how to ensure that and then suddenly the organized sector like us because we had the supply chain running suddenly we started getting more supplies of milk 20% more milk and where you have got the limited processing capacity because of small players or unorganized player not come buying that milk which they used to buy so everything is coming to you and they expect you to buy and then to ensure that your truck driver your cleaner your factory workers your retailers they come out of home no doubt when you sit in truck of amul or a milk tanker when you use right milk or amul it is essential so very rarely somebody will stop except the state border but when you are coming from home to the office coming to a truck in the first 4 5 days when i mean no, no, no nothing was clear no passes no this covid pass etc so that was the challenge but i tell you i mean we also learned i think the biggest uh, i mean discoveries or learnings is i think is the first thing is what we are doing here 
virtual. I mean, how you can control virtually? How you can do business virtually? How can you can connect virtually? I mean, it was there, but we had no confidence. Working from home, I mean, during this COVID only the confidence came, yes. I mean, when people say I work from home, I, I'm sick. It doesn't mean that uh, he or she will do some musti and then one hour to work. I mean, it is a, I mean, I tell you example, my daughter is in Jalandhar, I Lord. She had to come tomorrow to Anand, afternoon flight at uh, two. She said, no, Papa, I'm not getting leave tomorrow. I've got some work. So now I'll come on the weekend only. So that was the seriousness people have taken. So, and then importance of family. I mean, everybody has realized the importance of mother, especially during this COVID and the family bonding. But this is the personal effort. But overall, organization level, I think we understood the importance of leadership, how leadership has to come out and lead from the front. And no doubt, uh, from our side, importance of food. And when I say importance of food, I mean importance of farmer in our life, importance of fellow who is growing food. I mean, nobody would have thought that, like you said, during this COVID, morning to evening, the one topic which was common across the family was food, what to cook, where to buy, who will cook, who will take a photograph, who will put an Instagram, and who will then chat on it. I mean, that was the thing. Yeah. And after the, we also tested the innovative, a lot of control systems. I mean, the GPS, which was not considered very important. I remember that we use Hilt up to the, uh, we use GPS up to Hilt. I mean, our, we are sending military across, across India. So over GPS, we could come to know where if my tanker is stopped by some police fellow at the Goa border. Wow. I have to talk to the chief secretary of the Goa that look here, my the military essential has been stopped. And then also importance of networking. I mean, if my Batala plant collector is not giving permission more than 10 people and you can't run plant on 10 people, whom to talk, where to talk and how to, uh, and also, I mean, overall, I think it is good, but overall for food and consumer, but one major change, which is very, very overall, if I say positive is no doubt consumer was shifting from unorganized or unbranded to the branded or organized sector. No doubt there was a shift, but this COVID has accelerated. But one positive impact is that consumer have shifted more toward not only branded, but trustworthy brands. Available brand. Absolutely. Available brand. And most important is affordable brand. Yes. And visible brand. Yes. And that is that I think the very, very positive. And I think all the uh, consumer uh, food companies have learned a lot and got positive impact of the COVID. No, th thank you for that, uh, Dr. Sodhi. You have made me, um, you know, get more respect for this food procurement process because it is so easy to just complain. You know, we had a shortage of some food availability over here in the initial uh, point when COVID had just started and it was so easy to just say oh food is not available but you know um, I have learned a lot more uh, about the supply chain issues and so thank you for that. Um, I, I would like to shift to Mr. Nikhil Arora. Um, Nikhil so uh, you know uh, COVID uh, affected small and medium businesses a lot more and so there was a survey done where you know, about uh, a third of small and medium businesses said they were struggling to even survive. And in this cash trap scenario, I'm assuming you know, GoDaddy, which is uh, providing a, you know, a, a major product to these small and medium businesses would have also had its own set of challenges. So could you please let us know about the challenges you faced and maybe some opportunities that came up uh, during you know, COVID? Uh, thank, thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be here with uh, fellow panelists. Uh, um, so, you know, at, at the on on onset, let me just kind of just talk about what the macro level shifts which, which happened and then really uh, map them back to, you know, the audiences uh, we serve. Uh, you know, as GoDaddy, you know, our, our mission is to empower everyday entrepreneurs where we help your dreams come online, grow online, and thrive online, right? So essentially, if you have an idea today, you know, how do you bring online? You kind of buy a domain. 
and then you when when you buy a domain you have to bring it to life you build a website and now we have a website you know how do you transact and uh, talk to your customers and do commerce with your customers and so on right uh, that's very uh, at a simplistic level what we do uh, you know during covid last year a uh, lot of shifts happened and uh, you know i referred to this in in my ebook which is the subtle shifts of radical change but I, i i bucket them into what i call a gdp framework and it's not the economic gdp framework but uh, essentially what g stands for is you know the role of the government uh, dr sodi referred to some of the things where you know the role of the government was never so prevalent in operation of a private sector before uh, how you would move from one place to the other how goods would be transported what cities would be open what cities won't be open right the role of the government certainly became very proactive and almost an integral part of how you operate a business uh, the second one was digitization i think what we saw uh, a 10x acceleration in digitization what we would have seen in the last 5 10 years uh, third was you know deglobalization right a country started looking inward that, that that doesn't mean we would stop doing businesses with other countries but certainly there was an impetus to be self sustainable and look inwards to see you know how to kind of you know survive and help our help your own citizens and and the p stands for really purpose driven businesses i think uh, um, you know all my fellow panelists actually are great examples of that right now the consumer started looking at the brand in a very different way it was no longer you know what you're selling and how you're selling but about what do you stand for and what are you going to do in these times right uh, and then the other derivative of p is the public private partnership i think we saw you know the ppp model has been around for the longest time but we we actually saw it in execution where both the private and public sector were partnering together whether to, whether it was related to you know helping people get jobs or people just get food or people get vaccination or whatever so may be right so so i think these were the broader shifts um, for us uh, you know the number one thing was uh, you know people's businesses are online and the number one thing they struggled with was you know how do i actually renew my businesses you know it's a very simple thing you build a business online and certainly you know in covid times uh, you're not reachable uh, maybe you know you have people in the family who got sick and normally these things expire pretty soon right so the number one thing was how do we make sure that our customers businesses stay online which meant you know we we have a 24 by 7 customer care center right and we had to literally within a span of 48 hours uh, have 1000 people started working from home with all the infrastructure uh which was you know which was nothing we actually <laughs> planned for but it was a good lesson right i mean uh, what you know i remember uh, you know my my dad used to talk about disaster recovery plans and i used to think of it as very much of an academic concept uh, because i never actually experienced it and you know when you saw this is really truly a disaster disaster recovery plan and how many companies actually you know have that in operation right so we went through real time in 48 hours getting all these customer care agents um, you know ready to respond to help you either renew your businesses or make sure that new businesses which were coming online right um second one was i think there was a inflow of new businesses who were traditionally offline now to come online right uh, and that meant they needed to be finding the right domain names you know because naming is important and you know so how do we educate them and we ended up actually uh, launching something called godaddy academy which was essentially an initiative to help customers just learn about what is basic digitization right small businesses today whether we look at whichever report right there are 50 60 million small businesses in the country only one third are actually online and now this you know this number was increasing quite fast but a lot of times uh, customers are very confused on you know what does it mean to be online does it mean to be on instagram does it mean to be on a website does it mean to be uh, you know just just being out there uh, you know present in some sort of a digital way so you know we've helped the need to help educate uh, our customers or prospective customers on what does digitization mean you know how do you select your domain name what should you call it you know what what, what kind of um, uh, uh, you know digital marketing should you be doing you know what is good enough for your business versus what is too much for your business so good idea academy really came into operation to really you know do that and thirdly uh, i i think uh, and most importantly i think the health and wellness of our employees became a very integral part now every company has talked about wellness for the last many many years but this was the first time actually it came into really practical execution right the role of leaders itself changed 
uh, you know, the emotional empathetic quotient of leadership suddenly became very important, right? Because your employees and your customers, everybody was going through this time and, uh, and you know, people are working from home and somebody's home is designed to be worked from, you know, you can work because you live in a bigger home and somebody's home is not designed for that, right? So how as a leader are you, you know, making sure that, you know, you're, you're, you're providing them as much flexibility, as much, um, I would say, help, uh, whether it relates to your physical wellness or mental well wellness and so on, right? Uh, and then I think I would say the lastly thing was about, uh, you know, women's participation. And I must say this, that, you know, one of the misses of, of, of last year was that when you look at all, all the panel discussions, which would have happened, right? Everything went online, right? Uh, there was less than 15% participation of women in panel panels of many subjects, perhaps we had a lot of women out there. And, you know, if ever there was a chance and if there is ever a chance to bridge the gap of women employment numbers to increase in our, you know, in our economic life cycle, right? Today, you know, you, you may say we have 15, 20% women participation. If you double that, you know, the GDP itself will go into billions. And, 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 you know, that was a missed opportunity, not because it was by design, but because people were in a rush to provide the expertise. But I feel like this is an opportunity uh, which, which is in front of us to really bridge the gap because it doesn't matter whether you're in tier two town, tier three town, you live in a village, you live in an urban city. If everybody's online, as far as your talent and skill, uh, you know, maps to that, now certainly, you know, the word is, you know, boundary lesson and so on. And in, in conclusion, I would say, you know, this is the first time everybody's went back to beginner's mindset. So whether you're a seasoned leader or whether you're a new leader, it was like everybody was dealing with the same information on everyday basis. So processing of data became important, but the importance of intuition also became very important because you, you're going by in a lot of intuitions about what to open, what not to open, and you know, and when to kind of operate your business and when not to operate the business and so on. Uh, thank you, Nikhil, for that, especially the GDP model that you, you know, spoke about. It seems very interesting. And um, you uh, touched upon a topic which I do later hope to address, which is you know, women's participation in workforce. And we will talk a little more about that once we get through a couple of other issues. But thank you for bringing that up because that is a topic which I think, um, like you said, is very pertinent in COVID. And so we will take a look at that in just a bit. Uh, so coming to uh, Mr. Akash. So Akash, um, you are involved with impact investing. And in one of your past interviews, I heard you say that, you know, you wanted to make Bangalore the philanthropy capital of India. And I really wish, um, uh, wish you well in that because Bangalore is a place very dear to me. Uh, but I wanted, I was wondering how philanthropic efforts have been affected by COVID and, you know, whether there is still similar interest or has it even increased because people are becoming aware of, um, humanity as a whole uh, and all of the issues related to that. So could you comment on that? Uh, thank you, Asai Priya, and uh, thanks panelists for joining us this evening. And uh, this statement was made, I think, when I gave a talk at the House of Parliaments. And uh, definitely the dream is still there to make Bangalore the philanthropic capital. Uh, it is still the social laboratory for the country. India as a whole uh, still remains the social uh, capital, social entrepreneurship, and social innovation laboratory for the globe. Almost eight to nine uh, uh, social ideas which have come up from India have become global successes, and so on and so forth. So coming to your question, maybe I'll step back a little and remember that it's almost exactly a year when COVID started and the lockdown started in India. I think it was March 16th or 13th, and when Prime Minister Modi came on the TV and said, uh, we are locked on for a single day and then it went on for a month and couple of months etc uh, most of the global economists uh, believe that uh, we will contract by almost 20 30 percent 23 percent was the general consensus and uh, i would say 60 70 percent of the economists believe it will be a v-shaped kind of a recovery or at most a u-shaped kind of a recovery and uh, as we see it has been a k-shaped kind of a economic recovery which we have seen uh, though we might argue what is the steepness of the both the arms of the K, whether it's extremely steep or the lower bottom of the K is not that steep. But given the situation we are in, uh, there is no doubt India has done relatively well looking at the global economy. So I'll come back to your question. So at a broader level, I think the 
global GDP has contracted by around four, four and a half percent. From 87 trillion, we have come to 82 trillion. And uh, I think in September 2020, when I gave a talk at New York University, nobody believed me when I said we will come out of woods much quicker, much stronger, and our numbers will be much better by Jan, February 2021. I think 80 percent of the audience didn't believe in what I was saying. And even today, I stick my neck out and say, I think in the first time in the last 16 years of my career, I'm saying this, that short term, we are bullish, long term, we are cautious. It has been the other way always. Short term, we are cautious, long term, we are optimistic. So I believe uh, short term, we are aggressive, bullish because of the parameters which I can discuss with you in a short while. And long term, I think there will be challenges uh, which India will face. Coming to uh, the impact uh, investment space, performance based philanthropy, etc. etc. I think there has been a great amount of acceptance among the large foundations and large family offices that running a foundation is a different ball game, a different cup of tea than running a IT company or a pharma company or any other large listed company, be it a $10 billion company, $2 billion company. Most of the large foundations set up their own family foundations 10 years back, 12 years back. Today they have realized the hard way that addressing that problem needs a lot of unlearning. And hence you see, especially in Bangalore, in the last one year, I've been a part of uh, two collaboratives. And India Impact Collective, which I just founded a year back, is nothing but getting 40, 50 large families of the country, the who's who of the country, to come on a collective joint platform instead of doing individual projects and duplicating it. And we have seen the last 60 years, half of the problem which we have been talking they still remain so, be it literacy, be it low cost housing, financial inclusion, women empowerment. We keep hearing this budget after budget after budget, but we have not seen a single island of excellence any part of the country. Not even a single state we have seen an island of excellence addressing one problem at least 80-90%. So this platform would try to bring the top 40, 50 families and address the problem which you are trying to uh, say that COVID has in fact given an impetus for the time how to stretch every dollar which they are contributing. Earlier it used to be just like create a hospital in my family's name, run a school in my XYZ company's name, XYZ. It's not happening that way. Today they are running it like a complete corporate structure where there's accountability, there are parameters, there are matrices to measure the impact what they have created. And if they are not the expert, they are humble enough today after maybe a decade of trying all possible ways to accept that let us give this business, if I can call business, to somebody else who understand this much better, who could marry in maybe public policy with business, with understanding of ground reality. So sitting in Bombay in some ivory tower or sitting in Bangalore, I do not know what's happening in the remotest part of Jharkhand. And India is not one country. We are 26, 27 countries within a country. We are so large. A Bihar behaves very differently from what a Karnataka behaves. So I would say that this could have not been better for us. There has been complete disruption in the social sector. Disruption in terms of the money which is flowing in the social sector. The number of new innovative ideas which are coming, for example, setting up of a social stock exchange. We would be the second social stock exchange in Asia after Singapore. And that has been uh, a, a dream project of Nirmala Sitaraman for the last two years. We have been working towards setting this up. And uh, in the next 60 seconds, I can just tell you the importance of the social stock exchange. Today, we do not have a mainstream platform to create liquidity, to create marketplace for social entrepreneurs, especially on the debt side. You have X number of ventures supporting on the equity side, be it an angel investor, a venture capital, X, Y, Z. But you name 10 companies of scale and size who are supporting on the debt side on the social sector. So I believe the social stock exchange, thanks to BSC, et cetera, et cetera, coming together with the expertise from global markets, would be a floodgate opening moment for us. And if that falls in place, uh, just like we saw the success of a BSE SME exchange, where we have more than 300 companies listed, 
and five years back when I was a part of the BSE think tank uh, to talk about how does SME get listed, people did not believe that more than 10 companies could get listed. None of the banks are ready to give them loans. They had to struggle, the guys and the companies which were in the bracket of 100 to 200 crores, they did not find X number of bankers extending the red carpet which a 1000 crore company was getting. So today that's the reality, you have 300 listed companies, we have proven them wrong. Similarly, I believe in social stock exchange, we will create a marketplace, liquidity and we are talking of close to uh, $8 billion in the next five years. That's the size which you are talking about. That's that's a, uh, I mean, thank you for giving the you know broader picture and also telling us about the social stock exchange. I mean, academic research shows that companies that are more focused on corporate social responsibility were able to overcome the previous financial crisis in a much better way because customers seem to be um, responding to that. Uh, stockholders seem to be responding to that. So I, I do believe that, you know, having a social stock exchange would be an amazing thing. For India and so uh, thank you for letting us know about that so uh, you know moving to um, you know we understood about the challenges so I also wanted to briefly understand about some innovations um, like Nikhil briefly mentioned about GoDaddy Academy I think that's a breakthrough innovation because this is not something that you would have thought of in a, at, at probably a regular point in time and so um, um, you know uh, Mr. Amanpreet could you tell us about some innovations that you have had, uh, you know, uh, at um, Airbnb regarding, you know, due, that came up specifically during the COVID time. Sure. Um, I think what the pandemic has done is that it has forced all of us to challenge old assumptions. And I think we kind of heard across industries, across segments that that happened. And uh, while we challenged old assumptions, we also considered newer alternatives. And I think this is a model that's driving business recovery for many industries, including travel. Uh, but it also was something that we saw internally and externally. Now, obviously, when the pandemic struck, the early days was kind of posed a huge challenge, right? But I think that's when you go to the fundamentals of what your company stands for. And we were determined to continue supporting all our stakeholders. You know? um, so it was whether it was the host community, whether as a two-sided marketplace we have guests and hosts both so whether it was the guest community as well as our business stakeholders whether it was you know internal employees and that was a very important um, parameter for us as well or you know financial investors as well so what we did was we kind of looked at all the key stakeholders and said we need to do something across the board right for each of them so i'll just start with what we did with our hosts uh, what we understood was that the host community were the most impacted because there were massive cancellations that happened at the last minute um, given that travel was getting restricted and so Airbnb came up with a 250 million dollar host fund primarily to support with grants so that you know um, businesses smaller micro entrepreneurs or everyday hosts who were impacted by sudden cancellations were being supported what we also did was you know kind of change internal policies around cancellations um, or extenuating circumstances policy that helped cover hosts and guests with more flexibility around um, how to deal with, you know, the upcoming reservations, etc. What we also did was that we have a super host program, hosts that have exhibited amazing hospitality over years, they get a special badge um, uh, as a super host. We also created a kind of a fund that would support a super host, um, given that, you know, they were also facing some difficulties financially. And hosts across the world, including in India, were benefit beneficiaries of, of that fund. The other thing that was very important for us is just to understand the need of the community, right? And then what we understood was that the heroes of the pandemic were the frontline workers. Um, and they required temporary accommodation because you know they were spending 18 hours, 17 hours um, servicing uh, the society. Um, and uh, our community wanted to help. And so we launched very creative uh, initiative called the Frontline Stays, wherein we opened up our uh, platform to hosts who would want to provide temporary accommodation at a discounted rate or even free and we partnered with agencies across the world to provide this frontline stays as a program to the frontline workers which were you know the the most important um, i would say uh, soldiers in that time of the crisis per se so i think that was something that where we re reacted to the need of the community which was very very important and as i mentioned right uh, wellness and safety health protocols were very important so airbnb came up with a a, a cleanliness protocol which was aimed at smaller accommodations so people guidelines and standards um, which we consulted you know global health experts including the US 
Surgeon General Dr. Vivek Murthy um, and the CDC to kind of come up with the guidelines that would help smaller homeowners and smaller micro entrepreneurs to kind of continue hosting in a safer manner. And obviously we created guidelines and responsible hosting pages for our entire global community to know how to kind of, you know, look at local guidelines, etc. So the idea was to provide as much transparency and information possible to both sides of the community. One thing that we did as a company that, you know, when I look back in hindsight was very important for us is the ability to continue to listen to all the voices and connect at the grassroots level. So when we were talking, we made, you know, hundreds of connections or, you know, listening sessions with our hosts across the world. Edwin is a global company. We are a global platform. We are in almost 190 plus countries. And so what we did was we made sure that we spoke to our hosts on the ground and they came up with ideas. So one thing was very clear, given that hosting was shut, people were not traveling. There are many people who depend on the supplementary or income that they earn from hosting. And so there was a need economically for them, them to continue to earn. But also there was a need on the guest side for people to still connect, even though virtually. So based on many listening sessions, you know, one of the hosts came up with the idea of online experiences. Now we had already launched experiences as a product along with our stays where people would get access to other person's passion and get, you know, uh, learn a new skill um, by spending a few hours with them. We thought, why can't we build this over a virtual network? And within 14 days, we scrambled a team and we got the online experiences as a product out, which helped hosts to continue to share their passion through the virtual network, but also earn money um, in that meantime and for people to connect over, over when they could not travel in person. And this product was such a big success. You know, we, there were about 50,000 odd seats booked in the first two weeks of launch. That was one of the most, uh, I would say, rapid growth that we have ever seen for any product. And that happened during the pandemic and it came from an idea from a host. And so it was very important for us to make sure that the connect was already there. And if you look at the, the way the ecosystem developed, right, uh, the lines between travel, work or living were all blurred. You know, work from home could happen from any home. And so we made sure that we ran campaigns that inspired people to work. And, and when you say the work from home, the home could be anywhere in the hills where you could drive or, you know, go to anywhere else. Um, so we made sure that people understand and get inspired by these new travel trends and were able to kind of have a change in scenery. So we worked with entrepreneurs, creative, um, you know, professionals to kind of lead the way in the, inspiring others to kind of, uh, you know, demonstrate the use case like this. And that was also very successful. And over the few, you know, months, what we have seen is that the pent up demand is definitely there for people to travel. Um, and that's where local communities and what I, what I mentioned earlier that people are making more responsible choices. Um, what we are seeing is that underserved areas are now coming up on the platform cities that you would have not heard of villages and neighborhoods where the local micro entrepreneur is now bringing the stay online. And that is kind of helping them kind of bring back some economic activity um, that kind of benefits everyone. So I think overall, I would say listening to our host was the most important thing and making sure that we do something for all stakeholders was even more important. And so everything that we did, whether frontline stays or whether the cleanliness protocols was primarily directed in one direction to help all our stakeholders, um, you know, face the crisis. You, you took us back to the very basics of the business, right? Listening to your uh, stakeholders. And so um, it's really amazing. The product that you mentioned, Airbnb at home, I have checked out and, you know, I, it was wonderful to see things like a day um, in Paris with the Parisian. So uh, I'm very glad that product is doing well. So um, my uh, next question is to uh, Dr. Sodhi. Uh, I know you introduced some uh, new products during COVID, but I also wanted you to, uh, if you could briefly comment on your marketing strategy. So not just your new products that you introduced, but the marketing strategy because seemed different from what others have been doing during the uh, COVID uh, period. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Kamat, you are right. During this COVID, we <clears throat> introduced a lot of products, especially for immunity boosting, whether turmeric milk or ice cream or other thing. <clears throat> But well, you see, marketing strategy also was the, this was the time to build relationship with your all partners. When I say marketing, who are your marketing partners? Generally, people think marketing partner is advertising agencies. Okay. Or the, your 
distribution channels but more than that is the consumers so one thing which uh, let me tell you now let us start with the distribution marketing innovation what we did we realized you see in case of amul or dairy there are three types of distribution channels one is for the dairy product i mean butter cheese milk uh, butter cheese and uh, all ambient product then is for ice cream frozen minus 20 and third is very important is fresh product where we are distributing milk or uh, curd or the butter milk across india what we realized during this covid the ice cream distribution whole supply chain was lying idle because the during march our ice cream sales reduced by 85% people out of home consumption was nil moreover people were apprehensive about using ice cream consumer ice cream and that was also three four hours windows were available in the morning hours in the city everybody was buying just essential so and there was more pressure on our other distribution channel which is our for fresh product or dairy products because the retailer has to buy retailer has to sell distribute the sell the all the product during the 2 3 hour so overnight we shifted our whole ice cream idle supply chain whether in the processing unit our labor is there or our uh, transporters are there or our distributors are there or their salesman infrastructure on other two chains so their resources their infrastructure their investment used for the this thing and we could service the market also well during the 3 4 hour window so one was that then was on consumer side well you must have seen that during march month when this was announced that uh, lockdown most of the brands stopped advertising or reduced advertising but i realized or we realized that over home that people are watching more and more tv and especially the news and that time i think the one thing which immediately in the march only by 11th or 12th we did is we negotiated with all the channels to go for one plus one scheme and we doubled our budget so four time more exposure with the double budget then this uh, then uh, opportunity came of of Uh, epic uh, serial of uh, 90s ramayan and mahabharat durdarshan announced and uh, we realized that our home like my home four generation watching tv together my father myself my daughter and my granddaughter and what programs you will watch you like to show all such programs so we got sponsorship of these two program overnight at if i tell you the just cost One tenth of IPL cost, advertising cost last year, not this year. And fortunately, we got ten x viewership of IPL final, so hundred x benefit. Just and what logic we use? You see, you are not advertising and brand building for sales pitch. And brand building is a long term asset, and you build an asset. when market is low you are getting at a very good price and it is a relationship and it is a way of communication if your family member which in this case is a consumer is in distress in difficulty you don't stop communicating this is the best time to communicate so we thought consumer in distress consumer want to know whether amul will be available butter will be available milk will be available so this is the best time to advertise and uh, i think we got all the jackpot <laughs> absolutely and and one jackpot which i think you know either you are no we started live recipe session on the facebook and we realized all the best of the chefs are lying idle at their five star all over the world so we approached few of them and the, every party was volunteered free of cost free of cost and best of the chefs all over world and you know we we running more than 1000 live recipe session with 2000 chefs across the world and you know how much viewership we got we got viewership of more than 600 million this is the 
longest running live recipe maximum watch at zero cost and that's that's just brilliant that's no issue yeah yeah and that, that was just brilliant so you have encouraged me to go and check out your live recipes because like i said in the beginning we are always in need of recipes facebook anyway. you can go i mean yeah. uh, absolutely oh i've got to go and check that out um so moving to mr nickel um nickel you uh, you know I, i would like for you to comment on the innovations at go daddy but also you know if you were to give uh, you know one piece of advice from your book not to take anything away from your book uh, but you know if you were to give one piece of advice from your ebook to entrepreneurs what would that be i, I think you know it's 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 i think both aman preet and dr sodi and uh, you know akash had referred to it it's not nothing new but i think it's just underscored the importance of purpose and mission and why you exist uh, i think uh, you know for the longest time you know it's it's nothing new people have a mission every company talks about the purpose but actually relating and living uh in a live way i think this was the time where i think consumers right and even dr sodi's example right that advertising wasn't happening because people would now buy more products but they were re- relating to you to be being a very empathetic understanding uh, sincere and you know conscious of what's happening around brand right and i think that really i think goes back to entrepreneurship and startups right that i think it's it's more about what problem are you trying to solve but what is your mission right and and i have talked about this you know what is the difference between a missionary and a mercenary uh and 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 missionary is the one person who always you know starts with the problem and lives the problem and wake up every day to say i am going to do this for my customers or my employees right and then the and the money part comes secondary it's important but it comes secondary and and you can never convert a mercenary to a missionary and what i mean is if you start you start a business saying i'm just going to make more money uh, and you you're not living and breathing your mission you will never ever you know get to a point where you need to be right so be missionary first and mercenary next and that really is a simple thing i believe you know is the most important thing of the business and if you always go back to your most common denominator which all my panelists referred to right your customers your ground level reality you can always find answers right uh, you may may not have all the solutions but if you're able to go back to that reality you can uh, so that that's really you know, you know kind of the, the biggest one i would say in terms of uh, some of the innovations i think uh, uh, i clearly talked about the academy right which was really about uh, both about driving education of what digitization is and also i think we realized a lot of people were wanting to now you know maybe they're out of jobs right and and so we we figured that the freelance industry is going to now become more prevalent and freelancer doesn't mean even within the companies you could be a freelancer right as companies are downsizing they may look at you know multi skill multi functional expertise so less number of employees but they are more you know they can kind of have more broader set of skills so we introduce certification programs within our academy so for example if you want to be a web designer right uh today if you want to be a web designer and you become one but if you go to um, any customer and say hey i'm a good web designer the customer may say okay but how do i know and so if you put a go daddy certification which is really the power of our brand we felt like they would get an additional asset now to go and market themselves so we introduce these certification programs uh, which which just enables these freelancers to now market themselves well and gain credibility um second thing we realized was that you know a lot of a lot of businesses um were coming online right and just give you an example right the hyper local world came back you know you were living in your own neighborhood and perhaps you only knew one or two or three shops around you which were used to you know go to now certainly locked down you need to know all the 15 20 30 shops you know what's happening around so every business wanted to come online uh, but they don't need anything more than a basic presence right so we we came up with a product what we called a startup bundle and what essentially it means is you know think of your business card right and and what do you mo- what most of the businesses need right not the heavy duty ecom businesses if you are a a pharmacy uh you know 2 2 kilometers from your home they need a basic website uh and they mean they need a basic email and they need the name of your web you know basically what do you call them right so we introduced this kind of product called online startup bundle basically with within like 30 minutes you have your online presence in less than 500 rupees and we felt like 
you know, this is the best thing we can do to, you know, get a lot of these offline businesses online without breaking their, you know, breaking their back and just give them something where they can start, you know, putting themselves out there. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. So no. So that's that's just brilliant. I mean, you know, in just five hundred rupees, if you're able to get your business online, I think nothing like it. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'll let you continue if you had. Yeah, and just just two more quick points, and I think uh, you know, similar to what Akash was mentioning, right? We also uh, realized that the social entrepreneurship world is really taking off, right? And and and, and so we actually partnered with a couple of platforms like Keto, where we realized a lot of businesses needed fundraising, right? And because they were out of business, small businesses, right? They're getting out of business and they needed money to raise to even pay the employees or keep the lights on. Uh, and so we, we, we came up with an innovative program with Keto where we, we said, hey, if you're a small business, you can actually put your cause out on Keto. And so it doesn't need to be a cause for somebody's medical treatment or somebody's uh, you know other type of hardship. It is a very business cause that, hey, I'm kind of going out of business uh, here's my business. Here's what I do. Please help me. And the power of crowdsourcing there. And we, as GoDaddy said, we'll pick up all the cost of facilitating all that, you know, that, that, that well, initiative. And, you know, that ended up giving many small businesses an avenue to raise, a, you know, kind of raise money, whether it's, you know, 50,000 rupees or whether it's 10,000 rupees or 1 lakh rupees. But that was material money for them to hold on to the employees or keep the lights on, you know, for, for really you know, kind of, you know, three months or four months and so on, right? So, uh, so the, those are a few of the examples, you know, we, we, we kind of came up uh, during the during the lockdown. Yeah, I, I saw your slogan of open we stand and I would assume all of this falls under the open we stand and that's just brilliant that you are supporting them to survive and, uh, you know, I know a few entrepreneurs who I'll be directing to your academy soon enough, so, um, but thank you for that, uh, Nikhil, and you, you brought up uh, an issue earlier, which, you know, uh, probably will be the last question we'll have time for, because uh, Pranit just texted me uh, that we don't have much time remaining, so, uh, the, you know, the issue is, um, uh, Nikhil, you mentioned that there's a, a lot of opportunity for, um, uh, we could have, you know, encouraged women to come in, but uh, the issue is when when you read articles like the recent one in FT, uh, a survey showed that women are feeling they are sent back to the 1950s because of, you know, the expectation of uh, office and home, you know, and so uh, it's becoming really difficult to encourage women participation. And so um, I was wondering if each of you could uh, maybe, you know, comment briefly about how you're uh, encouraging women participation. I know each of you have some initiatives, so we'll do like a quick round of, uh, you know, answers. And so I'll, uh, I'll stick with Nikhil for the moment and then we go around. Yeah, so quickly, I think, you know, the firstly at GoDaddy, I think we, you know, we, we obviously have uh, a, a pay parity, you know, with, with, between male and female employees. So that's the number one thing we feel proud of. You know, our, our women participation in the workforce is about 30%. So it's not, you know, it's still, uh, we feel good about it. We all obviously want it to be, you know, at, at, at a 50% level. Uh, but broadly, what I feel is I think this is a great opportunity for all uh, employers to really level set, you know, the gap of both uh, hiring uh, women employees because in the past if there was an issue of okay you know maybe she's doing double duties and she cannot commute now the world uh, you know as Aman Preet had mentioned you know there's no line between work home and, and anything else so you know that that's gone and two I think it's it's changing our own mindset now to say okay it really doesn't matter where your employees but when you're hiring how can you be more flexible and understanding you know of of of, of hiring especially and encouraging women workforce. And it's, it's not about hiring also, it's also about pay parity. And I think not only about, you know, you increase a woman employment number, but also the importance of pay parity, right? So I think uh, those are the two issues. And I think in, in the online world, we have a great opportunity to actually change the curve, which has been there for many, many decades. Yeah, absolutely. And I really do uh, hope this is the generation where we have equal pay and not just equal opportunity. So Akash, I actually wanted you to uh, touch upon this issue where, you know, um, I wonder if uh, uh, the if, you know, impact investing sector could make a difference by investing in education maybe to uh, encourage women participation. So could you uh, talk briefly about this issue? Sure. I think uh, as uh, Nikhil was mentioning, uh, one of the key takeaways and the positives of uh, the COVID has been the impact of digitization. So today, I think India is the largest or the second largest 
मोबाइल स्मार्ट स्मार्ट मोबाइल लेट कंपनी एंड द नंबर्स आर जस्ट इंक्रीजिंग बाय द डे नॉट ओनली स्मार्ट मोबाइल आल्सो द इंटरनेट सो वी ट्राई टू लेवरेज द पावर ऑफ इंटरनेट स्मार्टफोन स्पेसिफिकली टू एम्पावर वुमेन ऑन टू फोल्ड्स वन इज टू मेक दम ए पार्ट ऑफ द मेन स्ट्रीम बाय प्रोवाइडिंग सिक्स और सेवन मॉड्यूल्स विच एनेबल्स दैम टू बिकम एम्प्लॉयबल फॉर द लास्ट फिफ्टी टू सिक्सटी ईयर्स most of the government policies on education have been just to make the girl child attend the school the girl child attends the school up to 10 grade or maximum 8th grade there is a drop out at the 8th grade of 30 35% nobody has bothered to check what happens to the girl child after grade 10th is she employable or does she just get married or she just wasted money by getting education up to 10 she could have been better off helping the dad at the farm today she is neither completely equipped to become an employee or go back and do something in the agriculture land so we created the module with the help of the fast food chain companies be it a macd a subway or a xyz and jointly we created a curriculum wherein after completing the six modules you directly get a job with these fast food chain companies at a basic salary of 14000 up to 18000 depending what is the grade which the person gets in the modules that's number 1 number 2 we realize that in very com- at least 6 to 7 large business communities one example could be the fishing community and the fisheries in alibag area the bombay area 80% of the business happens through the women folk there are 23 societies you will be surprised not a single society is headed by a woman So when I was talking to the chairman of SBI at his uh, Nariman Point office, I pointed to him that this lady who is just on the boat, and the distance between her boat and your office is only two and a half kilometers, but it has taken her almost sixty years to open a no frill SB account. Why don't we just open a basic SB account, which enables her to have financial independence? The moment you give financial independence to the head of the family which in this case is a lady things starts to change there are enough and more data by lse by oxford by world bank that women manage financial what are savings in much much better fashion than a male guy would do in a really low income family so that's the second thing which we did we tried to encourage the business correspondence model to make large number of women come on board in the mainstream financial inclusion space in the third space which we have seen real real traction thanks to technology thanks to platform like the go daddy etc i think the number of small and medium sized entrepreneurs who are just doing petty business in their community they just went online there are successful stories i can name tens of them so like a lady who was just making pizzas at home that became a 2 crore business and 2 crore business is not small so on and so forth you know in individual uh, cotton sari business etc etc so we encouraged uh, the women uh, uh, from these communities to on board showcase their business on the online platform and to that we have tied up with some it companies to give them uh, technological assistance how to on board how to use it how to market it who should be your uh, payment channel partner etc etc so collectively we believe uh, uh, the covid has in in in, in a way bought at least 15 to 20% more women in the financial inclusion space stroke financial independence and i think this is just the start once they have tasted this independence and the freedom of having their decision power on finances they will not go back absolutely and we believe this is a excellent positive trend for us and hope it continues yeah, absolutely and so you know there was a recent video making the rounds where you know uh, people were taking a step forward a step back depending on whether they uh, know finance and there was a very clear gender disparity uh, yeah. uh, between men and women and i was shocked when i saw the video because i teach accounting i research finance and so i uh, reached out to few of my friends and i was very shocked to see that that was actually true and so um, i am very glad you are doing something in that space and so thank you for that uh, akash and so um, uh, dr sodhi um, you know uh, if you could tell us briefly about you know how your company is encouraging uh, women participation i know you had uh, some mou with the andhra pradesh government and so if you could speak briefly about this it would be great 
Well, <clears throat> Dr. Kamal, again in <clears throat> food, especially dairy or animals when we, it, it is the women who are basically in control of the whole business. Right. Let me tell you, right in the production side, in India, when I say 100 million families, in each family is having two or three cows of buffalo, basically milk production in hands of the women at the home or the kids. Man will go out. So they are the only who will take care of the animals, milk the cows, take the milk to the cooperative society and get the money. And it is not only giving them the financial independence. You see, it is also the dignity and the respect in the yes. uh, fa fa family or in the village and also giving them the confidence. And uh, let me tell you, no doubt out of, th on paper, out of 3.6 million members, only around 38% are women members. But let me also, out of 18,500 village cooperative societies, 2,700 village cooperative societies are 100% Women membership, management women, board is men. Besides, now in our processing plants, you will see mainly in the packaging side online, where the butter or milk, it is a women. And no doubt, our consumers, all decision makers are basically women and users are the women. So we are very much dependent on this uh, women, both the side. So both for the livelihood, governance, as well as for the uh, consumption, and it is being encouraged. Lot of government schemes. I tell you, in the case of Gujarat government, last three or four years, lot of government schemes are coming exclusively for the women cooperative, like free land for housing of a uh, village cooperative society building, or eighty percent subsidy for the milking machine. Reason is simple, because if you have got a four to five cows and buffaloes at home, and if you want to marry your son, no girl will be ready to marry her. She'll rather love to marry a security guard in the city than the village with the five. Because morning and evening, she has to milk all 365 days. So milking machine attraction in the villages are like the refrigerator or the TV attraction we had a few decades back. Yeah. So that's, that's <laughs> that is actually very interesting that you uh, that you know you're speaking of government uh, schemes to support women participation and I really do hope there are more such schemes. But I'm also very glad to see um, uh, the amount of women participation that you have in your own uh, business. So, so it is heartening to see that, and I do hope it uh, spreads across other businesses. So I would bef uh, before we end, I would like to just call upon Mr. Amanpreet and just ask about you know uh, how you're encouraging women participation in Airbnb. Sure. Um, so Airbnb has always been a community powered by women. In fact, you know we estimate that about fifty-five percent of our four million odd global hosts um, are women, and you know, and that women hosts have accounted for more than. 600 million in earnings um, in the period of the pandemic. So I think that goes a lot in terms of saying that how they have been at the forefront of kind of, you know, business recovery as well as economic recovery within the community. Um, if I just come closer to home, um, you know, the number is about 16 million rupees in 2020 alone that women hosts have earned during the pandemic. And almost 30% of the new hosts that came on our platform were women. And I think, you know, it's very it's not surprising, right? Hospitality is intrinsic to Indian culture and uh, irrespective of ownership of homes or anything, we know that women manage most of the micro entrepreneurial opportunities related to hospitality. In fact, we did a report with the Internet and Mobile Association of India and we figured out that the homestay sector, which is primarily driven by women, you know, is also a great, uh, has a significant employment multiplier effect. And we saw that happen in real life, you know. So over the last few years, you've had multiple partnerships with whether it's a National Commission of Women to train women entrepreneurs in, say, the northeast parts of India, or with self-employment groups like Seva, uh, which is a strong group, again, in Gujarat, where we trained rural uh, women from the uh, uh, you know association to start hosting rural homestays. And some of them have kind of now earned more than 50,000 to 60,000 rupees a month. 
and again to Dr. Sodhi's point, right, uh, that uh, the, it's about not only economic empowerment, but it also helps them uplift their strata within the society. You know, some amazing stories that we heard were that the village serpent would come to the women host of the village to say what other entrepreneurial opportunities can be created around the homestay experience. And I think those were some real good examples that were shared uh, with us. And so we continue to work on this uh, initiative, you know, irrespective of the pandemic or not. So we have partnerships, as I said, with NCW, with SEVA, as well as with DEF, primarily to train 15 to 20,000 women entrepreneurs on the hospitality side, um, so that, you know, the impact of the activities of hosting is not only limited to that household but then it also benefits the local hyper local economy because when people stay in airbnbs and neighborhoods it's not only the host that earns the money it's also the local restaurant the local artisan and the local grocery shop owner that also benefits from the local economy and so i think women are at the forefront of driving this and it will continue to be uh, a, a key area for us to focus on as we grow the community in india it, it is very nice to hear that 30 percent of your new hosts are women and all the initiatives that you're doing at airbnb to encourage women participation um so uh, I, I think you know that is the time we have for a uh, discussion amongst ourselves it's been brilliant uh, speaking to you so i'll now turn over uh, the um, hosting responsibilities to pranit who will take questions from the audience and you know uh, talk to you about any issues that they have raised but uh, thank you so much for uh, having you know discussed openly about the challenges the innovations and uh, particularly about uh, women participation so thank you for that thanks hi priya uh, thank you so much everyone uh, and all the panelists for lending such great insight into this discussion and thank you so much dr kamal for being such an excellent moderator i think we all really enjoyed the conversation that took place and it was very intellectually stimulating and we're going to take a lot away from this conference. And that's why there are a lot of questions in the chat as well. We may not have enough time to get to all of them, but I'll definitely try to shorten them down and cover up as much ground as we can. Uh, one of the really interesting questions that I saw in the chat was actually directed towards Mr. Uh, 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 Miss, Mr. Amal Preet Singh Bajaj. And uh, the, the question is posed by Mr. Tushar Mittal, who asks, how did Airbnb convince homeowners in India to let strangers in India stay at home? And how do you see this regulatory framework change in India for companies such as yours? Right. That's a very interesting question. And um, thank you, Tushar. But I think I'll just go back to the roots. Um, you know, if you look at India, there are two things that are core to us. One is hospitality. I think I talked about it. It's intrinsic to our culture. Um, for years, we have opened up our homes to friends or friends of friends or relatives of friends and always welcomed them into our homes. Um, and I think the other thing that is core to, uh, you know, the Indian DNA is uh, entrepreneurship or micro entrepreneurship, as I would call it. Um, and if we figure out that if there is a platform that helps build or bridge the trust deficit and kind of can create and empower people to become entrepreneurs, showcase the beautiful country that they have um, and, um, you know, give them enough tools, etc., to take care of some of the inhibitions that may have around, um, you know, hosting, um, then you know, bringing hospitality and entrepreneurship together becomes a great platform. And that's the kind of success that we have seen in India as well. Um, so what we have seen is that, you know, about five, seven years ago, we had only, only about 2000 or 3000 homes in India. Today, we have almost 80,000 homes across the country. And we are growing at a very rapid pace as well. And I think trust and safety is at the core of what we do at Airbnb by building tools, um, you know, using technology, etc. And I think when we talk to our hosts, we explain to them how these things function and that kind of builds trust. And at the heart of this system is the review system that is that you, that you see on Airbnb. Both the guests and the host review each other and they build a reputation over a period of time. And I think that plays a key role in, in building trust um, um, on the platform. Uh, thank you for that. And um, the next question that I have is was actually addressed uh, towards Mr. Akash Nahar. And the question is that are social corporations sort of held in the same regard as normal corporations in terms of returns? And I think this question highlights also a very key point, which is that people are actually not all that aware about impact investing and microfinance. So according to you, what's the best way to like um, raise awareness about uh, impact investing and microfinance, especially in a developing country like India? Oh, sure. Thanks, Pranit, for that question. 
and it's a very hot topic uh, specifically impact investments globally there has been an increase of 3000% in applications uh, in, into core curriculum which has impact investments uh, so the definition of impact itself is quite broad the definition in india has been quite fluid uh, majority of them believe microcredit, microfinance is also a part of impact investment. Uh, that's not true. It's one of the verticals. Core impact investment is trying to marry both social impact as well as returns. And it is a concept of dual balance sheet, if I can call, or dual bottom lines, where you have a tangible social impact. At the same time, you also are profitable. You don't try to cut your pockets and make some charity because that's not a sustainable model and we have seen that across the country, be it Mexico, India, Peru or any part of developing emerging markets, that is not sustainable. So the current model which we and globally is becoming popular is called as performance based philanthropy where you are responsible, you are accountable to every amount, every dollar which is given as philanthropy in the form of enterprise. So you encourage people with broad, bright path breaking ideas to scale up those innovative ideas and make it a business. There's nothing wrong in making profit out of a good idea, but there has to be somebody to handhold them till they become scalable, where the returns might not be at par with the normal marketplace. The ROIs can be six, seven percent to begin with, but then it really goes up. Is there enough capital for that? Yes. Is there enough awareness? No. Slowly the awareness is happening thanks to the large foundations, large families, and as I said, as the marketplace is created. Microcredit, in my opinion, has uh, been quite abused in the country, the term microcredit, and uh, exorbitant rates have done to a great extent damage to the poor families than actually bringing them out of poverty. They might be acting as a band-aid, but that's not a full-term, long-term, self-sustainable solution. And we have seen this in Andhra Pradesh six years back when there was a revolt from the local public, people shut down the companies, people had various problems. So we believe, very firmly believe, that philanthropy can be another asset class itself. Don't treat it as a charity. The typical jola and kurta, cotton bag attitude, mindset, visual impression has changed completely. You see large family officers recruiting people from Harvard, LSE, Oxford at expensive salaries of XYZ to create tangible, evidence-based products and solutions. And we have done that. So in short, impact is a growing space. Microcredit is not the end of impact. Uh, impact is a very broad space and uh, including dual bottom line would be beneficial for impact. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Nahar. And um, then, uh, Dr. Sodi, I actually have one really interesting question for you, which was posed by uh, Gaurav Bhairwani in the chat. And uh, this is a question that I had as well, which is, uh, you know, the, the Amul girl is such a big part of all of our childhoods. And I think across generations in India, because it's such a huge part of like the cultural zeitgeist. And could you maybe explain what is the uh, what, what was the genesis behind the Amul girl and, you know, your ingenious marketing tactics for Amul? Well, uh, Gauraji and uh, Praneet, <coughs> the background of this uh, Amul Batarga <coughs> You see, I take you back to about 54 years back. And when we launched the Amul Batar in India, and Poston was the household in like today's Amul Batar. If you ask your Father, your uncles, they will, they'll say anybody, butter, Polson was synonymous with the butter. And there, during those 50s and 60s, you'll find in the all food brands, it was the English brand name, either imported or local. Amul was the first Indian brand name with the Hindi name. Amul means priceless. Okay. And when we launched the Amul butter, and we wanted to create the brand. Dr. Varghese Kuren, the founder chairman yeah, of the Federation of the CEO of Amul. I mean, he has realized the importance of marketing and brand building 50s. We, Amul, started advertising 50 and brand building 50s. We have got media plans of that. 
so but we had the limited budget because amul believes in marketing in the umbrella branding and by spending more than not 1% of our sales turnover on advertising and marketing or brand building so that time task was given to advertising agencies guy solicitor decuna to build amul butter brand but with the minimum money create a brand image so that time he thought of a unique you see creative as well as the media creative was which is ageless which is always young which is amul butter girl and the media chosen was the holdings that time i remember when i joined in 1982 that time was the talk of we forum and only that time we had 27 holdings across india and amul butter girl basically because people used to talk about celebrity you have to build a brand celebrity so we created a celebrity a girl which can comment on anything happening in the world in the world or india whether political sports hollywood bollywood she does not spare anybody she does not favor anybody and she is not fearful of anybody and nobody minds also her comment i mean people say that you have to spend million and millions of dollars to get any celebrity to endorse the brand your brand and this uh, butter girl of this topical such a thing then all the i mean the uh, stars or the heroes or the who that they feel they have arrived all the celebrities feel they are arrived in their field if they come on our holding free of cost everybody wants to go whether you talk amitabh bachchan or pm or any deepika padukone or virat kohli i mean they are after us if we are <coughs> come without charging anything so this is the way of creating brand in a unique way a unique media let on we used press and now social media also but let me tell you you tell me you give me an example of any brand i mean if i go to any place like you you ask the first question anywhere i say i am from amul to bola dhubu se sadar ji aap kya karte ho i say i am a dood wala wo so the truck wala ke alawa dood wala honge so then when i say i am from amul so the first reaction comes is ki sardar ji aapki wo amul butter topical campaign unique you give me any example of any brand where brand recall is based on the campaign if i tell you sony what comes to your mind the tv comes maruti tell you the car comes to your mind but when i say amul that butter girl comes to you is a powerful and most important is consistency in communication utterly but really delicious campaign started 54 years back we are not changed it our amul dood pita india started 20 years back we are not changed it our amul, amul the taste of india campaign started back 26 years back still same uh, positioning no change Thank you so much for that, Doctor Sodi. That was very enlightening, actually. And I think you're so right about Amul Girl being like basically a superstar in her own right. And uh, lastly, I have a question for Mr. Nikhil Arora. Uh, this is firstly one of my questions because I really wanted to ask you this, as you know, as someone who's uh, because like our our graduating class is essentially going to graduate into a recession, into a time where it's difficult to get jobs. So a lot of people would be looking inwards and maybe. there would be like a sudden surge in entrepreneurship amongst recent graduates if you particularly have any advice tailored towards people graduating in uh you know let's say this year or next year when we will still be in this ongoing post pandemic situation what advice would you give them uh, what direction would you advise them to go towards in their life uh difficult question but i'll try my best i think uh Uh, i think one is to uh, you know look at more multi skill development i think uh, uh, you know i guess entrepreneurship itself is a you know a stream which 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 is built on passion so that has very variants but whether you're going for entrepreneurship or employment i think 
you know, diversifying your skill set is important because as I said before, right, I think the world will move into more freelancing state and freelancing means you are able to wear multiple hats of multiple functions and multiple skills. Uh, so I think that's number one. Uh, number two is I think, you know, as, as you get opportunities to do any sort of work experience opportunities, take it uh, because uh, I think because it's, it's going to be a choppy time for the next, you know, one year, two year. And, and, and so in the past, you would want to choose and select, um, you know, where you want to do. I think make sure you choose and select based on a value-based company, a mission-based company, it aligns with what you, you know, you, 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 you are as a person, but then, you know, don't worry about too much about, I would say economics at that point, you know, get, worry about just getting the right experience. Uh, third, I think certain sectors, right? I think we talked about whether it's a V-shaped economy or a U-shaped or a K-shaped economy. Certain sectors are certainly going to emerge, right? I mean, you, you're seeing a lot of action having happening in ed tech, for example, you know, a lot of, lot of stuff happening in digitization generally, regardless of the sector. Uh, and, 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 and so I think, you know, healthcare, right? I mean, that's going to be a big problem for here for a while to be, uh, to survive. Right. So I think focusing down on some of these, you know, sectors, if that is exciting to you, if not, at least making sure your digital toolkit of who you are is important because if it was, you know, good to have, it's now must have. And within the digital tool toolkit, I think everybody on this panel will probably, you know, agree that, you know, the data driven business analytics, I mean, that's really where there is not enough talent out there today. I mean, if you want to go and hire a you know, business intelligence person today, I mean, it takes a long time to get that kind of skill set. So I think data-driven mindset uh, and, and, and toolkit you can build uh, you know, is important. So practical experience gives you the intuition, data gives you the, you know, the really the, kind of the, the muscle behind it, right? Uh, those would be you know, my, my things. And then also, I think we talked about mentorship uh, and networking. I think please do keep that. I mean, you know, even on this panel, I'm sure if you reach out to any of the panelists, they'll be happy to guide you on a thing or two. And so the importance of reaching out uh, now digitally is obviously, you know, the, uh, what it's table stakes. Um, it, it can go far along, right? Because every job I got was through some sort of a networking of a panel like this. I'm sure every one of you out there can benefit it. If not, you develop a contact who can mentor you down the road. Uh, and I think that's, that's invaluable. Uh, thank you so much for that, Mr. Uh, like, I think, you know, and I would just once again, like to thank all the panelists and all of our audience for attending. I'm sorry if I wasn't able to get all of the audience questions in time, because obviously there were a lot and we have, we, uh, we're running under a little bit of a time constraint. So once again, I apologize for that, but I think, thank you so much to everyone for attending. And especially if you're a cricket lover, um, there's not a lot going on in India versus England right now, not a great match, but still this was, I think way more enlightening. And I think it really will help us will help all of us going forward in the future.